So uh, it was very, I think, uh, ambitious of me to uh, give a talk on this subject, is it like two weeks after the event? <laughs> so um, uh, I want to make certain everybody is aware that this is still a work in progress. If you have any ideas, let us know, because we're still developing a lot of the things that we're seeing. And I'm not going to present everything that we've seen, because some of it's not really my material to show. But expect a lot of papers coming out from our group. So. Uh, this work was done by me and all the other members at Haystack. Uh, everybody's played a pretty significant role in getting this data analyzed. Uh, so to begin with, I'm going to give you a bit, little bit of introduction. Several people know who I am, but uh, for those of you who don't, I'm going to talk a little bit about where I work and, and what we do. I'm going to show you some past eclipse observations and predictions of this event, and I understand people here are going to be working also on doing some predictions. So we'd like to kind of validate the models or do some comparisons between what we're seeing and what the models are. And I'll show you some early eclipse results. They, they will uh, extend. We, we deployed seven receivers out in the field, and I'll tell you our stories with that. Um, I'll tell you some of the <coughs> big issues I've been working on is how to correctly subtract the background from the, the data, because that's not an easy thing to do. And you'll see why um, we have three different methods, and I don't know which is the best, um, but you'll see where, where we are with that. And our light, our, I think most in, one of our more interesting observations is enhanced TEC, it may be a TID, what's called a traveling ionospheric disturbance, but it's clearly an enhanced TID that we see at the time of the maximum uh, solar eclipse above the Rockies, both the eastern and the western side. So, and then I'll summarize the talk. So, <coughs> this is where I work, Millstone uh, Hill. I actually began working with GPS when I was working for the satellite tracking program here. And we have a GPS antenna. Actually, it's right here on the roof. So I was lucky because at that time, uh, when I started initially working with GPS, a single unit was $250,000. And that was with the MIT discount. So I was very lucky because there's no way uh, the atmospheric science group could have afforded it at, in those days. Um, but uh, we actually, our offices are down here. But these are all the instruments that my group controls. And this, these are the two radars for the incoherent scatter radar, which was also operating throughout the eclipse. I'll show you a little bit of what we did. But I want people to think of the fact that we're really a global network of incoherent scatter radars. And we're the only instrument that can measure physical properties of the space environment as a function of altitude from the ground all the way above F. Region peak, we can measure electron density, electron temperature, ion temperature, plasma uh, velocity. And from these, we can infer electric field strength, conductivity, current, neutral air temperature, and wind speed. As a unit, I think we actually are a very important space weather sensor. And I don't think people are giving us enough credit for that. So I'm going to be pushing this um, over the next uh, year or so, just so that people are aware. All of our total electron content data that you're going to see in this talk is available through the Madrigal database um, right now. And we're trying to provide an enhanced product, which you can get from us if you personally talk to me. But right now, we have vertical TEC as, um, data in one degree by one degree bins, latitude, longitude, every five minutes where data exists. And this data goes back to 2000. So everything from 2000 on is being processed. So it's over 15 years of TEC data is available. Uh, <laughs> this is a movie that I think is just kind of fun. And it gives you a flavor for what you can do with TEC. This was uh, in 2005. It was during one of the big solar flares. And um, you'll see, uh, now the units here, this is differential TEC. And this is really going from minus 1 to 1 TEC unit. So it's only a fraction of the total TEC. But if you look at this, and where's my cursor? Oh, there it is. You will see, see that flash of red? That was 
uh, happened right after a solar flare. So you can see the ionosphere responds pretty quickly and, and really all across uh, the U.S. when we have a flare and if it's uh, underneath in the daylight part of the Earth. Okay. <clears throat> This is the current distribution of GPS or GNSS receivers around the world. Clearly, we're missing areas, but especially since I started, South America has really filled in, and we do have a lot of data both in Europe and the U.S. You'll see we have just got received funding um, from an MRI project where we are going to be deploying all of these receivers over here in Canada and these additional, well, these receivers in Canada and these receivers in Alaska, they're going to be located at Inuit schools. So Alaska has already set up and has the, inter, um, the um, internet capability from these schools so that we can get the data back. And we are hoping and aiming to get the data back in real time so that people like NOAA can actually use it in their real-time prediction models. But one of the uh, problems with these areas is a lot of our space weather occurs at these higher altitudes. <coughs> and these receivers here, they were placed by the, geo, um, the geodynamics group for, for geology. They're looking at plate motion. But they're, we're missing all of these receivers up in the area where space weather really starts. And by putting these uh, here, we can actually capture a lot of these aurora. And you'll see this is Kp equals 2, and this is where the aurora is. And we'll be able to get much better coverage with this new network of receivers. And the same is true in Canada. So uh, expect that to happen sometime in the next few years. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on some past eclipse observations we've done with GPS and talk about some of the predictions that were made for this current uh, event. So a partial solar eclipse occurred October 23rd, 2014, and I think there's a movie here. And you can see this is the shadow. So I think it's only about 90% in the maximum, and the maximum I think was over Canada, but um, it, so it wasn't a total solar eclipse, but it was about 90%. And uh, in fact, I think this, this view graph shows it. So it's this area up here that was 90% obscured, and this was 40%. So if you look now at what we see with the GPS, um, and what I did for the background subtraction here, and again, uh, this is one of the tricky things to do. Before the event, you did, the, the GPS data looked pretty much um, like this. And then the differential to you see, you start to see depletions here. By later on, I think these are half hour increments. This is now in the full part of the uh, eclipse. You can see a, a big hole right over here and this hole extends over here. So we clearly saw uh, depletions up to about 10 tech, eight or nine, 10 tech units in this area during this event. And it seemed to compare fairly well with the GUVI ON2 data, although I have heard from the GUVI people that they don't trust this data. So I don't know exactly what to make of that, but it does actually match our TEC observations fairly well, that it's right in this area where they're seeing a large depletion, and that's where we were seeing the same kind of depletion. Now, <clears throat> there was a total solar eclipse over Europe March 20th, 2015. And oops, I think this is a movie. Hang on. And again, you can see it goes over Africa where we don't have a lot of data, but then it goes over right through here over Europe where we have a fair amount of coverage. And again, if you look at our, our TEC data, again, doing a background subtraction from an earlier day, you definitely see a large hole over Europe where we have data, and that corresponds in time to 
right this point of the eclipse where most of Europe is being obscured. And here it is. Now, <clears throat> this is a different kind of background subtraction where we were actually doing differential TEC using our averages um, during the same day. So the trouble with that is the eclipse lasts for over an hour. So we're actually picking up some of the eclipse, the subtraction, so it under emphasizes what you're going to see. But even so, we have a, you can see how it changes as we go through. And again, look at Europe and look at where we're seeing the greens and the blues beginning to develop through here. So again, our problem is that we have probably underestimated what we're seeing because of the way we did this background subtraction. All right. And this, I think, is just a, a comparison of, of just one frame where you can clearly see that we see a depletion. And it was about this time during the event where we this matches to right here. And this is the black dot is totality, so we're a little bit off totality. <laughs> so if you go back in the literature, and I was trying to actually get a few other papers, but I'm just going to mention this, which is from October 3rd, 2005. So at this point in time, we're in solar maximum. And in fact, a much bigger solar maximum than we've had recently. And they had a number of GPS receivers. This is Norbert Tchaikovsky. And you can clearly see this depletion here. He's plotted the previous days and the day after are these dotted lines. And this black line is the day of the eclipse. And you can see a clear, clear evidence of a hole in all of these data. Uh, some of them are closer to maximum than other places. But the, the bottom line is there's about, he observed about a 30% change in TEC. All right, so kind of file that away. And then for this eclipse, uh, Joe Huba and I think it's Daniel yeah, Drobe, Doug Drobe, uh, did uh, some model runs with SAMI 3 looking at the impact of the solar eclipse. And what they predicted was, this is their TEC. I think it's up to, well, I think it's on the next slide, but a large decrease in the F region electron density. And a, a, this is the TEC, up to five units. And I think he's predicting about 35%. I think I have his summary here, right, his summary thing. So they predict a reduction in solar EUV will uh, cause the electron density to decrease by up to 50% in the F region because of decreased photoionization and dissociative recombination. They predicted 35 decrease, and he says roughly, in TEC units, as large as five TEC units. Um, the photoelectron heating of electrons is also reduced, leading to a cooling of electrons by up to 800 kilometers, I mean, sorry, 800K in the upper ionosphere and plasma sphere, roughly a 15% decrease. The reduction of ionospheric pressure in the F region during the eclipse also causes the O2 velocity, uh, O plus velocity to reverse direction from upward to downward, from 40 meters per second up, down to uh, up to 20 uh, meters per second down. And lastly, the continental size modification of the ionospheric conductance results in TEC electron density changes in the conjugate locations. So that's something that we are looking for. We don't have anything to report on this yet. But, um, and this is the same kind of movie for our event. As you can see, it covers the whole of the US. Um, and it lasted for a little bit over two hours before it left. So. Um, to give you some background on uh, August 30, uh, 21st, which was when the eclipse, the solar flux, and I think it depends on whether you're looking at the um, 
average solar flux, which I think the 90-day mean was 86, not 74, versus the daily, but it was fairly quiet. And the KP, this is the day we're looking at. The KP was three, but everything else was much lower. And in fact, most of the uh, clips happened when it was two or less. So it's in this very fairly quiet time, which is good for us because it means that when we're interpreting what we're seeing, it's not very disturbed. However, you can see on, on the day uh, afterwards, and in fact the day afterwards, it's quite disturbed, and it was also disturbed on the day before. So these are reasons that we've had to uh, look at this issue of background subtraction. So early eclipse results. So I begin. This is actually data from our incoherent scatter radar. So. Uh, and this is just a summary of what we have, but this is a non-eclipse day, and it's just the zenith antenna looking straight up. And you can see that as al altitude profile, that it's fairly consistent, fairly smooth throughout the day, whereas on the eclipse day, and the eclipse really starts where this dotted line is. So something was going on even prior to the eclipse. So it seems a little quieter earlier on than, than right here. And then you can see this big hole, and then it, uh, a recovery, fairly fast recovery, so it looks almost normal within an hour or two. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, we do everything in universal time. Otherwise, we'd be doing with too many time zones. And here, basically, this is changes we're scanning. So we have one radar that looks straight up. That's what I just showed you. We had another radar that was scanning uh, more towards the region of totality. And here you can clearly see this hole starting to emerge right here. Well, th this is before, and this is where the hole is. Totality is right here. And this is this actually is showing you the eclipse line right there. So again, it's very clear that we saw evidence of ionospheric changes with the incoherent scatter radar. And the advantage is we have estimates of the electron temperature and the velocities, and uh, we're beginning to work with that. Wait, what? Oh, I think that was, hang on. You mean this day here? This is, actually, I have to look at it. I think it's the day before. It's the current day. I think it says. No, sorry, this is 15. Sorry, it's the same day as the eclipse, 1530. And this during the eclipse. It was the slide before that had the whole day. All right, so one of the big things I did was try to actually get a number of receivers deployed along the region of totality. So we had, we borrowed five from UNAPCO, we got two from MIT, one from Tom Herring, and one from another staff member at Haystack and we deployed them at these locations. We were working also with a group of scientists at Virginia uh, Tech, and so they actually had four of our receivers. Dolores here had one of them, and uh, um, I, we sent a staff member to this site here in Wyoming uh, from Haystack. Oops. All right, did you freeze? There, this is actually so um, we identified seven sites. These are the names of the people um, and all of their affiliations. Uh, John Swoboda from uh, Haystack was with Terry Bullitt here at NOAA, who was deploying a, a digisond in Wyoming. And basically, we had a system where the GPS was transferred back to Haystack in near real time. In some cases, that meant we got the data after the experiment. Um, and, all, and we returned all of the hardware directly to UNAVCO, and then the rest was returned to Haystack. So it actually worked out very well. Um, this is the, I think Dolores took this photograph here. 
Dave, okay, so I should change that. <laughs> Uh, but um, this is actually the setup that we sent everybody. I was very proud of our Haystack people because normally when you have this antenna, we have these $200 you know, surveyor uh, quality um, tripods, and they, they actually built this, this broom, broomsticks, and they had our 3D printer design, the, the little thing that they screwed. And actually, I think we were able to, to fabricate these for under $20, which was fantastic because we needed something that they could go and they could set up and then take it down. So, um, and this is Dolores' father. And I want to say he's uh, near, he's a farmer. Here, here he is with the GPS uh, receiver. The data from that unit was one of the best, and I think you can see this was an excellent environment to take these measurements because there's no large structures around and uh, he was a very willing uh, participant so we're very grateful. <laughs> um, and in fact you can see this is their data and if you compare it to our South Carolina, Carolina and Oregon uh, data you can see that it is a lot smoother and I think that's just multipath issue. But the main thing you, you want to see is that here is a clear, obvious uh, hole, and here also we have a hole. If you look very closely, you can see evidence, and I think you'll, you'll see it in other, other cases, but there's little squiggles on this line which are related to TIDs. We do have evidence, but I'm not sure uh, we're, we're doing a lot of research before we make any conclusions, really. But in all cases, you can clearly see the hull. Now, we had seven receivers, right? I'm only showing you three here. What happened to the other ones? Well, first off, we took our, this is just an example. We took all of our data <coughs> from the start of the eclipse. And what we used here for a subtraction was I took the data at 1645, supposedly before the eclipse actually touched the con continental U.S., all right? <coughs> and you can see a 40% change in TEC on average in this hole, all right? Which I, I actually really liked this photograph. This is going from minus 5 to 5, and you can see there's a reduction, and it actually agrees with Joe Hubas. He said maximum of 5 TEC, and we probably were averaging minus 4 here. Oops. <clears throat> so what did our other data look like? Well, this was from our unit, I think this is another one in Missouri, Actually, because we used, we were trying to do things on the cheap, we had a receiver on a board and we actually didn't have a, a full, full uh, it was just a chip. And, and we designed it, and we were hoping to get data at a slower cadence than our regular units. And you can see there's some kind of problem. Um, so this data, you can see the hole here, but I would be very careful of, of using this data for. They had multiple batteries with multiple. Uh, multiple, satellites. so it's tracking multiple satellites at any one time. So. Well, it's hard to see here, isn't it? But um, yeah, this one, it's hard to see. I, I'll show you in the next one. But uh, certainly, basically, what we're doing here, we've converted all of our line of sights to vertical TEC. So we're tracking, say, eight different satellites. And then we multiply them times a, what's called a mapping function to get it to vertical. And we restrict the data to data from 20 degrees up. So that mapping function is not a large large value. And here, this is actually a good site, and you can see, if you look very closely, these I think there's some evidence of some here, but I want to show you, we also have TIDs earlier. So the question is, are they em being emphasized by the eclipse, or are they just always there? So we're, we're looking at it, but you can see a very large hole right here. And another thing we'd like to do is these are obviously at different ionospheric pierce points. 
we'd like to correlate the ones that are closest to the, the maximum, um, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, this is the one that I am saddest to report. This is our data from Wyoming, and we really wanted our Wyoming receiver. And you'll notice, and, and I actually have data from this receiver for many days before and many days after, worked perfectly. So what happened during the eclipse? And it was a clean cutoff and a clean start up. So I'm like looking at this, trying to, you know, it didn't come all at once, but I finally asked our staff member, were you near any truck stops? And he was. And so our supposition is that uh, one of the truckers had a GPS jammer on board his truck because, you know, truckers tra are being tracked by their GPS unit. So if he turned his GPS jammer on so he could stop and look at the eclipse, nobody would know where he was. And so we didn't collect data that... In I mean, it was just exactly when the eclipse was. And the reason I, I'm pretty sure, because, you know, I'm, I'm talking with uh, John trying to say, well, what was going on? I said, oh, there are a lot of people, about 1,000 people. And I said, you know, 1,000 people aren't going to, you know, have any effect on whether your GPS unit works or doesn't work, right? Uh, but then, then we realized that there were a lot of, there was a truck stop and there were a lot of truckers. And I, I'm just absolutely sure that's what happened. And I wish we could have, you know, have one of those homing devices work, because it's, it's completely illegal to do this, completely. And we could have gone to him and said, you know, you've got to move, we have a scientific uh, experiment going on. But, you know, we didn't find this out till after the fact. So, uh, and I was really sad, sorry to see this. All right, so um, this is actually a view graph I made for Dolores. She was saying, okay, this is a great haul, but what did it look like the day before? And it looked like this. So when we do the same kind of subtraction, that 1645 UT from uh, the day before at 1815, this is what we see. When we do it on the day of the eclipse, this is what we see. So I'm pretty sure this is at least, maybe not absolutely correct, but there, we clearly see the, some effect to the eclipse on this day. And, and we see a maximum of about 40% change in the TEC, which is a little bit more than Joe Huba. But if you look at the values, I think it is about five TEC units. So maybe he was assuming a larger background TEC. It would normally be red. That's exactly right. And it's and I do it bin by bin, and these bins are one degree by one degree. So, um, but it is t that's why this is red, because it's uh, later. Do I need? To, you'll see, you, these are the discussions our group, and I'm going to go into that. Yeah, you're right. Like, how do we? How do you do the right? background subtraction, because obviously, you're absolutely right, we are under, underestimating this, because I'm not, not taking into account the fact that the ionosphere should get larger because it's a later time in the day. And I didn't take that into account. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and this is just to show you in percentage. I was showing you in total units, but um, the percent difference here, using this technique, we're still getting certainly above 40 and maybe even 50 percent. So a fairly large percent is, is being changed, even doing it in a way <coughs> that is underestimating the TEC. So this is now just a movie of the total TEC, and I want to show you because even without any background subtraction at all, you're going to see here the effect of the solar eclipse. And I like it because it's so obvious just from, uh, and this is before, this is still 1630, the eclipse starts right about now, and this is it. <clears throat> and again, this is just pure TEC.
And I think it leaves the U.S. right about now. So this is the tail under the shadow right here. And, and there it takes about an hour to fully recover, maybe even a little bit more. Oh, good questions. <laughs> and am I going to be able to answer all of them now? <laughs> uh, no, I can't answer it. So after many, many group discussions, we decided, among other things, to examine another day for background subtraction. So we chose the 30th because that had a very similar solar flux, very similar, very low KP. So that was one way. Another one was to use the model that was developed by a graduate student, Ziwei Chen. And uh, my name's on the paper, but Sheng Rong was really very much instrumental. <laughs> and he, we developed something using uh, empirical or orthogonal function analysis and modeling of GPS TEC data. And I think we used about 10, year, 10 years of data to actually come up with this model. And the main thing is it accounts for diurnal, seasonal, solar cycle, and spatial variations across the North America. And the average error is only 1.2 to 2.6 TEC units. So we felt this was a very good first cut, something that we could look at and use this to subtract off. Um, we know what this is actually bad receivers that we've since taken care of. So this whole is uh, actually bad. Um, what else was I going to say about this? But, but basically, we decided to look at this model and also look at another day. And just to show you, this is actually August 30th, which is the day we, we chose as a better day than, than what I was looking at. And the F10.7 was about uh, 87. The AP was 5, so like next to nothing. And you can see this is the NA, uh, the model. And we used <coughs> these same inputs. Uh, they also used the, F, uh, the average F10.7 centimeter flux, which was uh, 77. And these were the values. Again, 1630 is before the eclipse. 1800 is the maximum of the eclipse over the US. And you can do a comparison. And there are differences. But overall, the numbers are reasonably consistent between our data and the models. And this is actually the difference between the models, the model, and this is the day of the eclipse. Now again, one thing I want to point out to you is that the, on the eclipse day, even at 1630, we seem to be kind of reduced before the eclipse even hits the US. So I can't really account for that. I'm just saying it's kind of already a little bit small, and but here's clear evidence of the hole at 1800. And this is actually a Larissa plot. I think it's uh, very good. So the red data, uh, she's done it for one location, well, for different locations along the eclipse and, eclipse, and the black is our GPS data. So the black here is GPS. And sorry, GPS data from the 30th, and the red one where you see this dip is GPS data from the day of the eclipse. And again, you can see the difference between the day of the 21st and the day of the 31st, even before the eclipse hits. But this line here is the uh, maximum of the solar eclipse right through here. And one thing to notice, or Larissa pointed this out, it looks like our peak drop in the TEC is a little bit before the peak of the solar eclipse. And I can't account for that. I don't know if, it, if this is actually on the ground and maybe it was a little bit different up at ionospheric heights, but that's something we need to look at. Uh, the model here, so the red data is the day of the eclipse. That's the, the model. And this very smooth black line here is for the 30th. So um, can't, can you see here? This is also for this location. The black is the 30th of the model, and the red here is the model. So I think they're all reasonable 
estimates that we can use as background subtraction. And what you're going to see here, this is the model. This is the model. This is the GPS data. You can see the clear hole here. This is the difference between the GPS data and the, the model. So this is where we've subtracted this from this, and this is what we get. And you'll notice, instead of that hole that I was seeing, you're, you're seeing a clear big drop here. And this is a difference in GPS um, when we subtracted the 21st of August from the 30th of August. And notice that that depletion is across the whole of the U.S. And the numbers here, we, this is going from minus 8 to 8, so we're clearly seeing more decrease in the TEC than we did with that other technique. Um, so basically, what I'm saying is we're probably going to present two or more of these methods when we actually present it. I don't know which one is right. I know that all of them have certain flaws. Uh, in some ways, I think using the model is the safest thing to do, but even that has some flaws. And I think the one thing we can say is the way I was doing it before, I think I was underestimating the total effect. And I think it's better to try and get the, a better sense of how much of the ionosphere is being affected on that day. So one of our interesting observations, and again, this is, is new, is that we see clear enhancements during the time of the, the maximum eclipse along the Rocky Mountains. And um, you'll notice there are other mountain chains, ones here, uh, the Appalachians, and there's uh, also some from uh, Sierra Nevada and the Cascades. But remember, the eclipse starts up here and goes down here. So it, it's the Rocky Mountain chain that we're interested in. And you'll see why I saw it. Um, I also like this plot. A, a lot, and I don't know if it shows as well, but you can actually see the mountain chains, and you can see the times. This is a, basically 7.30 UT, 7.45 UT, so at 7.45 UT, it's coming back over the plains. This is 1800, 1815. At about 1830, it's right before it hits the Appalachian, so you can kind of keep in those minds, but the big increase. If you look at it over here, there's a big increase in elevation right around 1730. That's the sort of beginning of the real Rocky Mountains. So, uh, And these are just eclipse times at the different places. And this is what I'm talking about. And you can see this, this is just clear night as night and day. This is when we did our differential technique, so we're doing one hour subtractions, and we're only looking from 0.1 to minus 0.1 uh, TEC units, and clear as a bell, you can see the Rocky Mountains. And what these uh, white dots are, because people didn't believe me when I said it, uh, I plotted out McBride, Canada, Spokane, Washington, Boise, Idaho, and St. George, Utah. So that, that's really the uh, western edge of the Rocky Mountains. <coughs> Over here is the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountains. This is Banff, Canada, Jasper, Montana, Jackson, Wyoming, and Aspen, Colorado. And again, you can see this. And there is, if you actually, this is 1732. The eclipse was maximum at Boise, Idaho at 1727, so five minutes before that. And this is 1748. The eclipse was maximum at Jackson, Wyoming, so right here at 1735. So this is a little bit more than 10 minutes, where this is only five minutes. But the timing does seem to be related. Um, and this is just to point out that anytime we have an eclipse, there's changes in temperature that happen on the ground. And uh, what they predict, this is just something from a NASA webpage, but the amount of temperature drop will depend on factors such as time of year, cloud cover, length of totality. 
in some scenarios the air temperature can drop more than 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think we saw that. But we did see changes around 10 degrees on the surface. <coughs> and the change will be less dramatic in areas outside the path of totality. So you're, you're having something that's moving across the land at supersonic speed. So these, this is a very fast moving uh, shadow that's moving across. And, um, and in its wake, it's changing temperature by about 10 degrees. Now, I have been looking on the web, but as I said, it's only been two weeks, so give me, so give me some time here. But I did find Douglas, Wyoming, there was saw an 11 degree temperature drop. Okay, so this is right here. Total eclipse was right here, and it kept going down a bit more. So we do know that there's a temperature drop uh, right at the same time or a few minutes before when we see this elevated TEC above the mountains. And again, this is Huntsville, Alabama. But they saw, they saw a 10, in Huntsville, they saw a 10 degree Fahrenheit change in temperature as well. Now, there aren't any mountains there, but this is all I have so far been able to get in terms of what's happening on the ground. And do I think this is related? I suspect this is where I'm definitely here in this audience to, to listen. I know that uh, orographic features can definitely produce gravity waves. Gravity waves can produce changes in uh, electron density. So is that what we're seeing? I suspect. But I, all I can show you is we have these observations. Um, now, I have one other one. So I was saying, well, do we see anything uh, over um, near the Appalachians when it hits here? And it's possible, but this is 1911, and the maximum was more like 1845. So this is a much larger difference in time. So I, I, I don't know. I'm just saying this is the data, perhaps. You still see a big feature here over the Rockies, the edge there. Um, and is this my movie? This is a movie. <coughs> so this is, again, differential TEC. We are starting to look at TIDs. Sheng Rong is really leading that effort, and I don't want to steal his thunder. This is just the one hour at, um, subtraction. So we're looking at sort of larger scale TIDs here. And you can see the feature. It's kind of interesting. There's clearly waves. Here's here, well, you saw it in there. And uh, I think there's a lot there. <laughs> and I'll show it to you once more. Look again for during the big hole is when we see the right there, you see the the movement of the, the gravity wave over the Rockies and then it goes away. And this is actually 21, 22, so there should be no evidence at this point in time of the eclipse. And this is now at one latitude, 40 degrees. Uh, this is all of the longitudes. And we just want to show you how strong the shadow or, or the, the hole looks as it moves across. This is where it starts right around 1700. This white line is the, the longitude of the totality as it moves across the US. So you can see at the beginning, our hole is actually uh, after when we see this. And towards the end, it's more at the beginning. I don't know what it says. And there's obviously features before, before the eclipse. I mean, these are, are clearly some kind of TID structures. And there's some evidence after. Um, these are probably not related to the eclipse. These might be. And I think you can see right in here, this is where my Rocky Mountain, uh, that red enhancement are the Rocky Mountains that we see. Hmm? There's an enhancement. Remember, this is sort of differential TEC. So uh, there, the total thing is decreased. 
but I imagine that there were different, there were waves going on. And were these waves, are they related to the eclipse from another place before it reached the US? I, I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I know, and you're saying, what was it? Pro I don't know, and that's a good question because everything you see on the web, they just start in Oregon, and it must have actually gone over the ocean, and you don't see it. So I, that's a that's something we need to look into, especially with this plot. We need to see what what is this? Yeah, I assume it. Yeah. Oh, you have a movie that goes all the way. Where does yeah, where does it start? Like so we have it east of the okay, where does it start in the Pacific? Was it? Like, <coughs> yeah, is it higher up? Because it. No, the movie you have, the show. What? The movie you showed us at Earth. Yeah. Show that so. that's true. I do have that movie. We'll go back and look at at the end. So I think we're. This is probably the last big slide I have. Yep, summary, so we'll go back and look at it. So um, so closely, really the big thing we've done so far is closely examine three methods of removing the TEC background. We realize that's a big problem, uh, and I think using the model is probably the simplest. Even that, I think, has some issues. General TEC behavior is the same among all three techniques, but the magnitude of the TEC change differs. Um, all cases suggest more than 35% change in the TEC. So the model, at least Joe Huber's model, is somewhat underestimating this change. Um, the enhanced TEC observed over the Rocky Mountains, its characteristics are being studied. Do I think it's related to the temperature change? Yes. Do I have, are we kind of floundering? Yep. Uh, so we'd be interested to hear other people's comments on that. and. We're obviously very much buried in the research here and we'll continue to be in our group for a while yet. Looking forward to it. So let's go back and just, if you don't mind, I'll show you that movie. Oops, where is it? It's right here, I think, this movie. Okay, it d definitely starts over the ocean. So yeah, there were effects, and it could be that, that what we were seeing is from the sort of trailing edge of that. And that probably even starts, does it give me a time that it starts? It starts at 1550, so yeah, that would, it could be related to that. Uh, well, it depends what kind of TID you're looking at. Normally, the large scale, well, they, they really do vary. Um, the, that, and that, those, I would say, are more large scale features. So they could be anywhere from 100 to 300 meters per second, but they can be faster. <coughs> if, if they're geomagnetic, they can be up to 100, 1,000. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Is moving and how this yeah. shadow is moving. Right. And we may have, so we may have some more insight when we look at the ISR data, which will have some velocity information. Um, but along the, I don't think we have any techniques of getting it from the TEC data, so. Go ahead. So, I try to say is that there's like do you see a, a correlation between what person is in TEC for the general TEC? <coughs> so in general, I've, I haven't seen a feature, but we haven't necessarily looked for it in much detail. 
we clear what i have seen many many times along the oceans there's a and that i think is related to temperature difference between the ocean and the land and i think there's something called ross b waves that get established right at that border we clearly see enhanced t e c along that along those borders but not every day and not all the time but but that's frequent the yeah have i ever seen anything quite like this no no but i mean it may really stand out because you have this huge depletion all around it and then you just have that one feature so what and it's not big it's point one t e c unit so normally would we see it we probably don't have the same subtraction that we would in a normal case Isn't that your group? Yeah, they have. Um, yeah, I saw. It, yeah, V. Another opportunity at AMS, you know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just check the uh, your research with uh, Laura, but do they, in their model, do they predict the, the uh, increase for the uh, total uh, total surface? I don't think they did when I was looking at it. To, I have that one plot, but I don't know. And so that in that one plot I have from their paper, that is probably before. I mean. This is probably before. This is the peak. But it takes two hours, right? For it to go from first well, to the last, it's two hours, I think, and ten minutes. Yeah, but that's across the whole U.S. I mean, it, you know, the the actual at any one point, it's it's not there. I mean, it's in totality for like two minutes, right? And right, then. But I mean, it's still, it's still attenuating the, uh, the, uh, you mean how big uh, is the shadow? Yeah, probably, yeah. Well, I mean, and that's what our, our later comparisons were kind of showing. When I was showing, it was just blue over the whole U.S. So. And it's going to be directly proportional to the area of Tethys. If it's the southern at 50% of the sun, it's going to get 50%. 50%. But see, I, th I think that's what we made. When I told you, when we were looking at it, it doesn't hit the U 
Oregon until like 1650, I mean, pretty late. And I'm seeing almost a full hour before that kind of a decrease in the TEC. So that's probably what you're saying is that that's where that's coming from, is that the effect is much larger than uh, we were giving it credit for. That's probably worth pointing out that it, you know, it's a pretty large effect. Any other questions? <laughs> I would definitely recommend going to the AGU session at uh, on solar eclipse uh, coming up because I think a lot of this work will be developed uh, further. And uh, one thing I didn't say, and we've done some early kind of look at the difference between when the maximum TEC reduction was and when the the peak was, like just doing a comparison, and there seems to be about a 10 minute delay. Like the peak of the solar eclipse is at 10, uh, at 20 hundred UT, and then it'll be 2010 at that location before you actually see the peak maximum decrease in the TEC. So there's like a 10 minute uh, difference there. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, if there's no more questions, thank you. Okay, thank you.